Thank you very much for coming. Um, we're here today to hear about the um, IMC, and Mark will be leading you through a description of the company, and I'll talk a little bit about the specific opportunity that flows through from that. Um, if and when anyone is interested in taking a share of the company, there's lots of paperwork, a deed of adherence, and uh, self-certifying um, for any uh, investors as well, but that's uh, uh, something we can look at later. So I'd like to hand over to Mark, and then I'll pick up in a minute after that. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Stewart. I'm the CEO of IMC, UK company started in 2012. We have an extensive management team that has a lot of experience. I was staggered to actually see that we have 180 years between us, um, five masters, 13 bachelor degrees, and we can speak 14 languages, which is very important when you're an international business, which will become more evident as we move forward. Okay, so who are our customers? What do we do? Well, we're a telephone company, but we're a clever telephone company. We're an automated trading platform called Banker Telecom that enables automatic telecoms trading and settlements. Okay, so this is not an ordinary phone company, but these are the types of companies that are customers. And these phone companies, internationally, they're set up with Canada top right phone time, uh, Japan top, sorry, top left phone time, top right uh, KDDI, Japan, New Zealand bottom right. I've set up on this graph uh, or slide um, geographically. But fundamentally, what do they do? They send calls between each other, SMS between each other, and then they have to pay each other. And that's the reason why we're in business, because we help them make calls, help them send SMS, and also help them sell, um, actually pay for those um, calls and SMSs. Okay, so a little r brief um, history of the company. We launched Ecomo, which was a mobile phone calling app, short for Economical Mobile, Ecomo, quite a good name we thought at the time, uh, I still like it, um, back in 2012 with a small EIS investment. We moved on, trademarked the company's brands, opened up a back office in India, and over time we grew the revenue quite substantially, and then Andrew joined as chairman, and we got to have 500,000 retail customers, which was quite good. The end of 2015, the world changes. Bright idea, because what happened over the last years prior to this point was that we realized that the telecoms industry hadn't changed. It still relied on banks who are inefficient, slow, um, and uh, quite often shut to actually make payments. And also, trades were still being done manually between friends as account managers between different companies. So at the end of 2015, we came up with the idea of Bank of Telecom, and we partnered with Western Union to help us fulfill that um, vision. And we launched the company and trade now as Bank of Telecom at the end of 2015. To help us implement the business plan, we then got licensed by HM Work and Pensions. So um, we were thought as visionary by our shareholders in, in, in June later that year when Brexit happened, uh, was voted to happen because basically we can hire international staff, just like a hospital, <laughs> okay? So we can hire anyone from anywhere in the world based on their skill set and language capabilities in Chelmsford. So we have a tier two license as a phone company, very, very, very unusual. Okay, going forward, Revenue Grew partnered with Amex, similar to um, Western Union. Uh, we also got an LEI number, very important, that enables us now to trade using our payments partners, but with unlimited trade balance limits. So we can trade any amount of dollars per day. Simon Leary joined us, who was a PwC uh, partner. We moved forward, revenue grew, contracts grew, new offices opened. Rachel um, was appointed from our Chinese, um, for our Chinese team in Chelmsford. And then Ellen joined as well. And our revenue grew substantially and we started in business in Chile as well. The main point probably to stop there on actually on Chile is that because we're international we realized quickly that there was something we could do very easily that no one else has done, had done and that was to trade internationally in English, Spanish, Russian and Chinese. 
which represented 90% of all business trade language. Okay? So you can still deal with IMC, Bank of Telecom, as a Chinese person or a Russian or a Spanish person, you can contract with us, you can trade in that language, and you can do all your business in your own language. You don't have to speak English. Major, major selling point, which was pretty obvious to me, but that's what we've done. Um, we then moved on to Botcoin, which is a natural progression of the Bank of Telecom. And we'll come back to that later. And we went past a thousand carriers, opened up in Malta and trademarked the company branding in different countries. So currently Bank of Telecom is trademarked in 32 countries and Botcoin, very important, Botcoin is trademarked as well, which means that Bitcoin can never be trademarked without breaching our trademark. Um, earlier this year, I was ranked in the top 100 CEOs in telecoms, which is very nice. Um, but we also won the global award for the best value added services provider in the industry in May in Berlin. Other um, companies that won were Deutsche Telekom, Orange and Hutchison, and IMC won twice. So we're amongst very good company names. We then were named as a partner of the GLF. What's the GLF? Well, basically it's an organization formed of 30, the 30 largest phone companies. Each of those companies' CEOs sits on a board and their purpose is to utilize blockchain to enable better communications for the world. And we were chosen as their partner for that initiative. 60 million revenue, so we're getting bigger. We then had also, we also have SMS clients and we're up to 200 at this point. And then in September, we were ranked 23 in the tech track Sunday Times 100, which is a major achievement in itself. And our run rates around 87, 90, 95 million, something like that at the moment. Okay, so what do we actually do? Well, to, the numbers are quite big for a small, you know, for a private company here, we're talking about 60 million revenue. Why is that? Well, basically the size of the market is, is huge. But what we actually do is we do two things. We're a FinTech company. We provide an automated trading platform called Bank of Telecom or platform as a service to the SMS and voice market. So all the phone companies that send those SMSs and voice calls around the world we provide a platform to do that automatically. We also have the world's first regulated international settlements company that uses blockchain to do the settlements, and that's a subsidiary in Malta. Okay, market sizes. The voice market is 2.4 trillion, roughly. <laughs> it's very, very, very big. We have, out of 10,500 customers, about 1,124 when the slide was produced. And when you look at the market share, it's, it's tiny, but it's still 60 million of revenue. So I'm trying to explain why the revenues are big. The actual market is huge. On the SMS side, we have 200 odd customers and um, that's even smaller market share. And it's a smaller market, only $100 billion. Then our last market that we're in involves payments, international settlements, which for the telecoms industry alone is about $18 billion. So all the phone companies paying each other have to pay the banks $18 billion per annum to pay each other, okay? So that's the three sort of markets that we're addressing. So what is actually Bank of Telecom? What does it do? Well, we've, we mentioned it's an automated trading platform this means that um, trades are done on merit, not because two account managers know each other and wants to give each other business, which currently happens in the market, which actually works mainly on a manual basis or relationship basis. We've automated the whole process. So from a bank of telecom point of view, we have bank aspects or USPs and we have telecoms aspects, which are USPs. On the banking side, and this is us, you know, basically saying to the industry, use us, trust us, because banks are so hopeless for us as an international organization or industry. These are the reasons that we can help you. They're quite compelling. If you imagine a market where you can set the payment terms and the sales price yourself as, as a seller, you can automatically get paid 
in two hours in 132 currencies to 170 countries rather than three to five days or not at all because it's Thanksgiving or a weekend or after cutoff. Okay, so this is basically a completely different world that we're offering. We're offering an international settlement service that's fast and always available, but also saves about 75% as well, whilst you make those um, faster payments. And interestingly, you actually receive the capital sum, unlike using a bank. So if we pay $10,000 to Deutsche Telekom, they receive $10,000, not 9,990, whatever. Um, and um, all payments are confirmed by email, which is good from Western Union on our behalf. And then on our customer side, all our customers are insured. So we have credit insurance on all our customers as well. So basically there's lots of benefits here, but the main one that everyone forgets is that you don't now need, as a Bank of Telecom member, any money to trade. Because instead of having cash flow negative trade environments, you now have a cash flow neutral environment, which means you don't actually need physical cash anymore to do these trades, which all the phone companies do. So the finance managers and directors love us. Banks don't like us very much. Um, on the telecom side, this gets very technical. I don't know if you're, anyone here is a telecoms person, but basically what it enables a customer to do of Bank of Telecom is look at all the different prices. There's 200 or so countries in the world. Every country has a fixed line operator, four or five mobile operators. They all offer a price for every country in the world. So the massive matrix, if you can imagine, of pricing. And what our system does, it automatically collates all the, all the prices from all the companies around the world, finds the, the cheapest four or five, tests them, puts them on the markets. Okay, so that's what we call the buy targets. Then the sellers basically post their deals, or routes rather, and that matches with the buy targets. And then when you get a match, you get a deal. When you get a deal, it's then tested. If it passes testing, it goes to production, production, and then it goes to trade. So this is an automatic trading platform for telecoms. And where it's different is that all the other trades are done without automation. So they're done between a salesperson, a rates department, a billing team, a finance team, an operations team, individuals within a phone company, all working on email and phone calls and Skype, trying to make deals happen versus an automatic platform. So the benefits here are absolutely, you could keep writing the benefits forever, but for example, you don't need, if you use us only as a phone company, you don't need a billing team, you don't need a collections department, you don't need a financial controller, because you're gonna get paid on time, every time, immediately. So you're never gonna to have to chase any debts. You won't need to have a routing team in your network operations center. You won't need any salespeople, you just need somebody to enter the system and post routes. So you don't need any sales skills or anything like that. It all works based on merit, commercial merit. It also gives you access to the whole global markets. We're connected to over 1,300 carriers. If you're a small phone company connected to 20 carriers, you log on and all of a sudden you've got the whole market in front of you. It's a completely game, complete game changer for small companies. And um, as I say, because we reverse bill our suppliers, our suppliers don't even have to invoice us, <laughs> okay? So they don't actually technically need a billing team. They just use our bills and receive the payments with them, but those bills. So there's a really big change here. So we also have some other brands. All these brands are trademarks. And um, our main business is Bank of Telecom, which we mentioned is the automatic trading platform, the voice and SMS for the carrier community. And also we have our international settlements business, which is the new business, which is blockchain-based international settlements using a token. Um, then we have some other standard sort of telco products and services. But the interesting thing is that because all of the value that we add is being, you know, um, now aware in the market of the value that we add, the actual uptake of customers is about 30 per month. So we do trade shows all around the world. We, we, we have 10 trade shows, we meet carriers. Um, a lot of carriers, will join when we meet them at a trade show. A lot of carriers just join because someone else has joined or because of, you know, they see us on, on, on LinkedIn marketing or whatever. But fundamentally, about 30 carriers are joining every month, which is absolutely amazing. 
and um, they all have to pay a fee, $250 per annum. Uh, so we have a nice membership fee um, coming through. So when we started Bank of Telecom, it was very, very late in 2015. We changed our model completely to the Bank of Telecom model. And then our revenues have grown from there as the big carriers came on. And as we raise funding, we deploy that immediately and get the cash to work to bring re more revenue in on our insured customer base traffic. So it's an amazing growth story, um, but when in the context of a $2.4 trillion market, of which we've got you know, seven or eight percent of, it's, it's actually quite, there's quite a lot of way to go here. <laughs> we made some profit, EBITDA was about three million last year. And I think what's really good is that we've now got market recognition in a massive way and it's become mainstream, not just within the telecoms industry. I was grateful to be voted into the top 100 influencers for the telecoms industry um, earlier in the year. Then we were chosen by the GLF, which represents the 30 largest phone companies as their technology partner for blockchain, which is really, really important. Um, and um, obviously recently we're, we were in the Sunday Times tech track as number 23 because of our performance and, and basically uh, how we uh, have performed over the last two or three years. Our team is small, there's 32 of us. There's a couple of people on holiday here <laughs> when the photo was taken, but there's 32 of us and they're all deployed. Chelmsford is a head office, we have our license to employ foreign nationals. So we have our two Chinese people. We have a Russian lawyer. We have uh, lots of international staff. In Moldova, we have the Russian team. India is the back office network operations center that keeps it all going. Uh, Chile obviously does the LATAM market. So we're a small company, um, but we have a very diverse reach. What's our vision? Well, basically we're gonna to get to 200 million uh, pounds of revenue in 2021-22 for our Bank of Telecom service. On the timeline, you would have seen the LEI, LEI number that gave us the unlimited transfer limits, which means that we can do a lot of transfers. We're going to go for 1 billion in the same year from our multi-subsidiary, which is basically based on blockchain. Um, so we have a bot coin, which um, is pegs of the dollar and we're using that model to um, carry transactions. We have no credit, no transaction limits. Um, JP Morgan are doing $1.6 trillion a day. We're talking about doing 1 billion a year. It's not very much, but it sounds a lot. Revenues quickly. Okay, last year 60 million, 3 million EBITDA. Year to date, that's only July to October, 29 million and 1.5. We're heading for 118 this year and seven million EBITDA. So we're, we're doing quite well. And although we're lagging on the run rate, obviously we're growing. So every, every month we get closer and we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We're also introducing SMS to our platform, uh, which is gonna come through. SMS has dramatically increased. I think you probably all notice you've got one-time passwords whenever you do anything online now. You have to do two-stage verification. That came in in Europe in February. And in Europe on February the 1st this year, the number of SMSs in Europe doubled overnight. So it's absolutely, you know, Moore's law times two. It's, it's incredible what's going on. Um, okay, so that was a very quick run through. And then I'm gonna hand over to Andrew, who will give you the corporate overview and how you can get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Good, that was a quick, um, a quick run through of the company. Obviously, we look forward to any questions you may have at the end. I'll just talk a little bit about the corporate side so the ownership of the company, thankfully, uh, Mark and I still have more than half of the company, but we also have this uh, group of angels who came in with us uh, in March, April 2017, so two and a half years ago. And their, uh, their net cost to get in was about 7p a share. They paid 10p up front. With the tax effects, it was worked out at about 7p. And uh, the current price is 80. Just to clarify from a financial point of view, the Bank of Telecom machine with 
1,300 members is essentially allowing uh, wholesale telco companies to trade with us and we're the counterparty. And therefore, we take a piece in the middle. Now, it might be twice a month, but the average amount we make is about 5% a month. Now, ideally, as you can work out, we should just borrow the money and not issue more shares, in theory. But we do both. This is some of the money we've borrowed, and this is therefore the piece that we keep for the company. And obviously what we keep, we roll over, but we also have a policy of paying 20% of net profit in dividend. Now, it's a contentious thing, we could argue about it for hours. Lots of people say if you're doing so well, you should keep your money. But the way we've set things up is that 20% of our net profit is paid out. The dividend this year should be 1p. Now that's pretty good when you paid 7p. And uh, hopefully the dividend, like everything else, doubles uh, every year. <clears throat> it's, we've had five years of doubling of revenue and of EBITDA uh, year after year. The share price, as you'll see in a minute, has been doubling every year for three years. Um, that brings up the question, naturally. How long can you possibly double every year? Well, if the whole addressable market is a football field, the piece of the market that we are today is this piece here. So given that the awards we've won and the level of high tech, the low staff, the lack of legacy systems is in place for us, we're a young company, we don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to grow substantially within that market. Share price. Um, here's the history since the angels came in two and a half years ago. Um, we had borrowed money with warrants attached. So when the price was 10p, we said we would give people uh, the chance to borrow at, uh, lend us money at 12%, but they'd also get warrants to buy shares at 16p, which at the time seemed like a fair deal. By the time we issued those shares to everyone, the price was 40. So they were very happy. Uh, we did the same thing again here, and that price is ATP for the end of next year. In the meantime, about twice a year, we do uh, offer the opportunity for people to sell their shares and other people to buy in. And these would be the, the blue amounts that have gone through. The last lot was at uh, 700,000 shares went through at 72 about a month ago. Various buyers and sellers. Currently, these shares are offered at ATP. Mark mentioned the uh, Sunday Times Hiscox Tech Tracker 100 index. It's been coming out for 19 years in a row now. These are some of the points on it. The fastest growing company there, 58 million of revenue loss making. You would expect people to pop in here, companies to pop in here at a high growth rate, but probably losing money. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But we're here and we're making money, quite a lot of money. If you wanted to find a company with our revenue or more, you have to go out to number 46 in the rankings. So we're quite unusual in the sense that while we're fast growing, doubling every year, we're also quite solid in the sense that we have an established profitability. This is a note of what I said about the shares available, 3.4 million at ATP. Um, about 40% of them are new shares. That's a 10 and a half times multiple of last year's profit, uh, EBITDA. And it's four and a half times what we expect to make this year. Any questions? I'm just going to ask you one question about, the, about what you just said about the trading of the secondary trading of the shares. How are you doing that? Are you doing that on your own? Yes. Platform, are you using a secondary platform provider to do that? So basically it's kind of ring you up and say I'm interested in buying and... No, we have a, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we have a deed of adherence and part of that sets out the rules for uh, buying and selling of secondary shares. Anyone who buys shares needs to check they're happy with the agreement and they sign it. Under that agreement, um, any shares that are offered by an existing shareholder need to be offered to the existing shareholders first. So you don't miss out on shares if, let's say, they're offered cheaply or something. Mm -hmm. um, any new shares that are issued uh, need to be offered to the existing shareholders. The only exception is where 75% of shareholders vote to avoid that rule, which would speed things up, and they might uh, 
uh, do that, and that requires 75% of all shareholders um, and also 50% of all the investor shareholders, the, the angels. Both of those conditions need to be met. So what happens is that we write to the shareholders, we say, there's someone offering shares. Does anyone else want to offer shares? You have a week or 10 days to offer any shares to add to that volume at that price. And then we say, these are how many shares are available. If anyone wants them, let us know. Now, if we have people who want to buy the shares who are not shareholders, we might offer the shareholders the opportunity to vote to waive the rights. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Typically, it's twice a year we do this. Yeah. What's the deadline for new shareholders, for people that want to buy in? Currently, it's the end of the year. But if the shares are all sold, then they'll be sold. Yeah, it's first come, first Sold serve. to existing shareholders or no, just No, now it's, first at the come. moment it's open. Yeah, it's open. So did the angels in, 2000, in 2017, did, was this already in place when they came on board? I mean, did they come on board knowing that they had a secondary market effectively on a, on a twice yearly basis? It's not fixed at twice yearly. It's just worked out at twice yearly. Um, I think they knew that we would make efforts to match trades. Yes. Um, but it's worked out that we've done it this way. So it's really a round of share trading twice a year. That, and they seem happy with that. The other thing about the angels, as you're probably familiar with that, they generally can't, the EIS investors generally can't sell for three years. Mm -hmm. So we have in mind that there'll be some shares may become available uh, around about April or May next year from those people. But it's about 12% of the company, it's not enormous. Would you plan to have a public quotation at some stage? Would you plan to have a public quotation <laughs> at some stage? <laughs> We're often asked about the exit and Given that we have more than half of the company between us, we're quite interested in its value. Um, but it may not be the way to go. We, we wouldn't exclude it. But uh, we think that it's quite likely that we're a target for a trade sale to either a telco or a financial company because we uh, think we're unique and we have something which could be built upon very easily by someone who had a lot of capital, which we don't have. So we're growing uh, more slowly, only twice a year, uh, because of the lack of capital. A large company could leap forward by buying us. It could be a telco or a financial company. We haven't included Malta in our forecasts because we're nervous of doing that because any realistic scenario looks very big and yet we can't guarantee it. So we'd far rather over deliver. We don't need to because Bank of Telecom is reliable. Actually, just to add to that, we haven't actually spoken about IMC Malta at all in our figures. It doesn't appear. But if, you can just, if we can just set the scene for what IMC Malta is, bear in mind we've got this $2.4 trillion voice market, $100 billion SMS market, and this $18 billion payments market to pay these phone bills and SMS bills. So what we actually have today is a 100% owned subsidiary in Malta under the guidance of the MFSA as the world's first international settlements company using blockchain. Sounds scary, but it isn't because it's a closed user group of clients that are the Bank of Telecom clients. We have a partnership with Western Union because if you think about it, it's not particularly useful having an international blockchain network if you can't actually pay any money into it or out from it. So Western Union are our FX partner and we're operational and we're about to launch and it's going to only go one way. How you put a value on that, Gartner said to us, you have no competitors, no direct competitors. It's a real challenge, but it's very valuable. We just don't know how much it's worth. Yeah. The reason it arose was that we found we were making over <clears throat> £100,000 on the difference between what we were charged for these payments and what we were charging the clients. And they were happy because they were paying three or four times less than they normally paid. And that's without the, the Botcoin system. It's, um, it's always worth a dollar. You can always buy a Botcoin for a dollar. You can always trade it in for a dollar more or less instantly. So there's no speculative capacity in the botcoin and it's only within the closed group and their telcos. But it's about a quarter of all the telephone activity in the whole world are members of the system. So they want to pay each other. So what would happen is, and what does happen, we've already traded over a million dollars of this. Um, they send in uh, $100,000, they get 100,000 botcoin. The money in the bank is always the same as the number of botcoins issued. We don't touch the money. And they can then use the botcoin to pay each other. And anyone who gets the botcoin can either use it to pay someone else, or they can keep it until they want to use it later, or they can get their money back. But it means that a third party payment can be affected by us 
and we charge them $10 per transaction, which is dramatically less than any other way. So it's instant and it's very cheap. And because of our connection with the GLF, which are the biggest 30 companies in the world, that's, there's obviously an overlap between the Bank of Telecom and the GLF, but it, it, makes, uh, it means that we cover an enormous part of the telco market. This could apply to other industries, but this is the one that we're in. So basically our payments take five seconds. We save 83.3%, that's the actual figure, based on asking our customers, 610 replied to us, uh, what they paid on average uh, for their bank wire fees, and it was $60 from, that was about 68 banks that they use. So we have an actual saving. We know um, what they're gonna save is 83%, and obviously five seconds versus five days, it's a no-brainer. Um, also, with the fifth edition of the MC Money Laundering Directive, Banks are now going to be under a lot of scrutiny on direct uh, on, on due diligence for KYC and AML. And with blockchain, it actually is a compliance officer's dream because you have a, a immutable, which means a recorded transaction that's permanently recorded, can't be deleted or altered ever in one place between two parties versus things that can be deleted that are on a series of transactions because when banks pay each other today, Maybe 10 banks internationally might be involved in one transaction with MC103s linking them all together at different prices, different rates. Bank cuts off. It's a nightmare, absolute nightmare. So blockchain is the way forward for international settlements. And the question I always get asked is, why wouldn't Lloyds Bank do this? And it's pretty obvious. Would they want to cut their revenues by 83.3%? <laughs> they probably wouldn't. So it's going to be a new entrant like us. And we're the first, and no one else can get to where we are within one year. So we have one year advantage. So it's an amazing achievement. But how you value it is difficult to say. So it's not in the figures. <laughs> <laughs> and could you just talk about it in incorporation, where you're incorporated, accounts and the board? Sure. sure, okay. UK company, three 100% owned subsidiaries. One in Chile, one in Moldova, one in Malta. Chile looks after the Latin Spanish-speaking market. Moldova looks after the Russian former CS states, CIS states, Russian-speaking market. And Malta is our financial subsidiary. Um, all accounts are um, up to date. We're just finishing off the audit of our current accounts this year. Um, and um, 30th of June, year end. Yes, 30th of June. And we, we're, we're um, all of our subsidiaries and the holding company are audited. So we've audited accounts already for Chile and so on. Looking at Companies House, you only have filleted accounts. Why yes. are there not full accounts for Topco? Uh, well, basically, last year we did 20 million revenue, um, and um, so we, were, we didn't have our accounts audited this year. Edmund Carr, who have always been our accountants for the last eight years, are doing our accounts and auditing them, which will be available. Uh, we can send you the full future. accounts. Uh, just be last year's accounts were not audited. No. Uh, no, the 20 million ones weren't. So, no. so the previous year, the year ended 30th of June this year, are being audited. Yes. Um, who's, who's, uh, two questions actually. So could you repeat the, the point you made about the SMS in February? I, I, I wasn't okay, basically as much as I should have been. Okay, European Commission introduced a law that meant if you make an online transaction in, in the area of finance, in insurance, banking, that involves logging in or payments, that you have to have a two-stage verification via an SMS. So on the last day of January, that you know, literally it was the last day when that didn't have to happen. And then on the 1st of uh, February it happens and the number of SMS in Europe doubled overnight. And uh, there's gonna be more and more um, security aspects using SMS going forward. Okay. And then just on the financing, I mean, so obviously someone's been lending you some money. Can you tell us who, who's been lending you money? Yes, uh, we have borrowed from the shareholders and that was the notes I mentioned, 12% per annum plus the 16, P warrants. Then we did a new issue that was 10% plus 80 P warrants. We also borrowed from a private company called Credit Force, of which I was chairman until a year ago for about four years. It's a private company. And if we um, go back briefly here, just to, to answer your question fully, uh, this piece of the ownership which is 15%, but it's going down shortly to just under 10% for 
due diligence reasons, um, is the estate of Don Hansen, who's a very good friend of mine who died uh, five years ago. And he was the first EIS investor into IMC. And he put in 150,000 pounds. And that shareholding is now worth about um, well over three million pounds. So he did quite well, uh, but he's no longer with us. And his estate is managed. Uh, now he has a private company of which I was chairman and that company has lent us about two million pounds. So currently we're borrowing. We borrow from lots of people. We borrow from Lloyds Bank and uh, who else do we borrow from? Uh, Spot Cap, Funding Circle, um, shareholders, mm. uh, angel investors obviously, and then many of them reinvested later on yeah. or sold and then reinvested later on. Mixtures of so I mean, the ideal scenario for us is to borrow the money. <clears throat> Financially, we should borrow the money. We have a market cap of about 32 million pounds and we have debt of about four. And we can make that 4% margin on, on the money so per month. So we should really borrow the money if we can. So we like to borrow the money as a preference. And if we can issue shares, we can also do very well on that too. Yeah. It sounds as though you expect eventually to be taken over. Um, uh, is that expectation because you think that somebody might actually, if your blockchain system works, you think that um, uh, an institution might actually want to take you over in order to, for example, um, challenge sw the SWIFT uh, interbank transfer mechanism? Uh, or uh, might you start doing that, or might these telcos start doing that themselves? Because they are also uh, beginning to challenge the transfer mechanism by having pay by phone um, transfers, hmm. in particularly in Africa. But it, where is your thinking on that broader aspect, not telcos, or rather perhaps telco clients, um, and just um, challenging SWIFT okay. generally? Well, the first thing to mention is that we're a business to business business. Okay, yeah. so our customers are big phone companies. Yeah. Um, anything that happens in the consumer area, retail consumer area involving payments is, you know, good, but doesn't impact on our business. What it impacts on our business is who makes the international payments, the large international payments. The payments can be $5,000, they can be $500,000. Um, the banks have an international department normally that does their international transfers and lots of phone companies to date have used those banks and had to suffer the, the poor service delays, high, high costs of transfers and amazing scenarios such as India, which I always bring up, which is quite funny because 10% of all international trade payments go in and out of India and India has 18 bank holidays a year, which means they're shut for a month a year. So 10% of the market is shut for a month. You wouldn't have that in any other industry. So it's not very difficult to be better than that, but we are superbly better than that because we can do five second transfers for $10 with unlimited yeah. transfer value. Mm. Wait, if I could add a couple of just extra mm. points on that. In terms of Malta, the history, it's, it's a very interesting situation. It's almost uh, just good luck that we were there, really. I mean, perhaps it was very clever, but it was also a lot of good luck as well. Cool. Yeah, uh, because... Uh, my understanding, uh, this is slightly before I got involved personally, was that the Maltese uh, government was lobbied to create some sort of uh, uh, regulation in order that the um, online uh, banking, uh, online, sorry, gambling business could move their roulette chips around and do, do stuff. And then, of course, they took it seriously, rightly, and they wanted it regulated and they had to do all these things. And we got involved because we could see the opportunity to capitalize on our uh, volu vast volumes of these telco payments that we couldn't ourselves do because they're third-party payments. So it's accidental in a way. However, once they started going through all the due diligence, know your client nightmare, com just, just appalling amounts of paperwork, uh, a lot, if not all of those uh, online casinos dropped off for all sorts of reasons. So we're left in a situation where there's really no one else who's actually gone all the way through the process to get to where we are in Malta, which is the only government that has actually put all that stuff through that they wouldn't have done for us. So it's a sort of a lucky situation in a real country, part of the EU and so forth. And the other thing I would mention is that we talked about lots of models and we can't talk about anything firm, partly because it's not been agreed in, uh, in, in detail. But there are various models whereby our relationship with the GLF 
which does represent the biggest telcos, and we are their partner for this already, could turn into something where we might end up with a much smaller share of something much more valuable because we can't carry this thing indefinitely and make the best of it that it could be made into. So someone else is going to have to pick it up in the next year or two. And I think it's probably going to be telcos and or possibly financial. Mark, Andrew, thank you very much indeed.